Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm really happy to see so many people still coming out to these. Uh, we're nearing the end of our series, so it's fantastic to see so many people still interested. Um, for those of you who I haven't met before, I'm Catherine Dale. I'm coordinator of the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Uh, and with me tonight is Jenna McDermott. Uh, she's the assistant coordinator of the Atlas, and she is our technological wizard for the evening. <laughs> and uh, she is also going to be monitoring the chat. Uh, so if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. Jenna may be able to help you out, or we can discuss them at the end. Um, okay, so Jenna and I, oops, got to move my slides ahead. Uh, Jenna and I both work for an organization called Birds Canada, uh, which many of you may also be familiar with. Uh, but for those of you who aren't, it is Canada's Voice for Birds. So we are the leading science-based bird conservation organization in the country. And our mission is to advance the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of Canada's wild birds and their habitats. Um, Canada, as you may have noticed, is a fairly large country, so this is a big mission. Uh, and one of the ways that we do this, really the main way we do this, is through citizen science programs. So through people just like you uh, who donate their time, their energy, and their skills uh, to collect information about various species of birds for our various programs. Uh, here in Newfoundland, we have two active programs at the moment. Uh, the first is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, and so what this is, is a five-year effort to map the distribution and the abundance of all of the species of birds that breed on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, so the map that you can see there is for uh, one of our species at risk, the evening grosbeak, which you can see in that beautiful photo. Um, and so really this is a massive citizen science effort and I'm not going to go into it in too much detail right now, uh, but in two weeks on April 17th we are actually going to have a webinar focused on the Breeding Bird Atlas, how it works, what we're hoping to discover with it, and also how you can participate and we really do welcome everybody regardless of their birding experience to participate. Uh, the second program that we run here in Newfoundland is the Nocturnal Owl Survey. Um, this survey was started in 2018 here and uh, has been growing pretty rapidly. Um, and I'm going to just take a minute to talk about it because that's actually happening now. Uh, so what happens with the uh, Nocturnal Owl Survey is volunteers sign up for a route. Uh, and each route has 10 stops. It's a roadside survey. So one evening between the 1st of April and the 15th of May, you drive your route with its 10 stops. And at each stop, you get out and listen for owls. And you also play a playback track that we provide. Um, so you actually play owl calls to try and elicit responses uh, from, from individual owls. Uh, so it's a really fun survey. It's actually kind of my favorite. Um, and as you can see, we, we've uh, got quite a number of routes. I think we're up to 68 in the province, most of which are on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, we are still looking to assign some of these routes. Uh, so we have a few that are still available. Uh, including um, one in Cornerbrook, which does require ATV access or side by side, uh, one in Cormac, um, one just north of Gambo, uh, and some of the routes near Grand Falls, Windsor are also available. Um, with the, the Nocturnal Owl Survey, I'm also always looking to develop new routes. Uh, so you can see we've got the Avalon pretty well covered and we do a good job of sort of the, the northeast part of the province, but the south is kind of a giant hole as is the Northern Peninsula and we have only four routes in Labrador. So if anybody li listening is uh, interested in establishing a route, just send me an email and we will see what we can do. Uh, we, we still have lots of time left to um, do surveys this year. So let me know if you're interested in the OWL survey. And finally, before we go into tonight's presentation, I'll just take a moment to thank our partners and sponsors. Uh, the Atlas in particular is a huge project. It is not one we could accomplish ourselves. Um, and so we really must thank all of the organizations that work with us or have provided in-kind support or financial donations uh, to make the programs we run here possible. And then finally, uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the lands where we are conducting both the Breeding Bird Atlas and the Nocturnal Owl Survey are the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose people have been erased forever. Uh, in addition, the island of Newfoundland is the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq people. These people have been protecting and stewarding the land here since time immemorial, and through the work of the Breeding Bird Atlas, we hope to contribute to this stewardship and the effort to protect all the species we share the island with. Birds Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems. We support the needs, aspirations, and rights of Indigenous peoples to care for the land. 
Okay, so the outline of tonight's presentation, I'm just going to start by talking a little bit about the State of Canada's Birds Report from 2019 uh, to just provide a little bit of context for what we're talking about today. And then I'm going to briefly touch on the species at risk legislation here in Canada. So what protections we have for species at risk, which will help us understand what's going on with all of the species that we're going to talk about tonight, which are listed there. Uh, some of these are species that we have talked about in previous webinars. Uh, however, some of these we have not addressed before because for those of you who were present at the other passerines presentation a couple weeks ago, uh, I ended up actually taking out the species at risk because we had too many species to cover that night. So some of these will be new. And then of course we will end with our quiz, as always. Um, so I'm sure you've all noticed that at multiple times during this webinar series, we've talked about various species or uh, being at risk or populations declining. And so uh, that's why I'm starting here with the State of Canada's Birds 2019. Um, so this report was published a few years ago. It draws on almost 50 years of data from various sources, uh, which includes breeding bird atlases like the one we're doing here in Newfoundland as well as breeding bird surveys, which are not the same thing. Um, they're a little bit more like owl roots, so people go out and do a root year after year. Um, and so all of this data taken together can be used to assess the health of Canada's bird populations. Uh, and really sort of the take home message of this graph is that there's a whole lot of variation among different bird groups. Uh, so we have things like birds of prey, which are actually increasing pretty dramatically. Uh, and that could, we still could be seeing the effects of the banning of DDT in the 70s. Um, waterfowl are also doing extremely well, um, but some of our other bird groups are struggling a lot. And in particular, I'd like to highlight the grassland birds and the aerial insectivores, uh, both of which are declining extremely rapidly. Um, and throughout this presentation, we'll talk about some of the reasons why that might be. So what does Canada do about this situation, about these dramatic declines in some bird groups? So first we have our Federal Species at Risk Act, uh, which is often called SARA, S-A-R-A, uh, which was adopted in 2022, and it allows for the protection and the recovery of species at risk on federal lands across the country. So species that are determined to be at risk are listed on what is called Schedule One or the SARA registry, uh, and they're listed as extinct, extirpated, so not present in a particular area, endangered, threatened, or of special concern. And under the Species at Risk Act, it's illegal to kill, harm, harass, capture, or take an individual of a species listed in Schedule 1 as endangered, threatened, or extirpated. Um, it does, the, the legislation, the protections don't apply to species of special concern in the same way. Once a species has been listed under SARA, the legislation mandates the creation of what is called a recovery plan. So that's for endangered or threatened species or a management plan for species that are considered of special concern. And the point of these plans is to stem population declines. Uh, species are then reassessed at regular intervals to determine whether they should remain on the registry or whether their listing level should change. And in fact, just before the presentation tonight, I was going through our species at risk uh, registry, which is public, uh, public information, you can look it up, um, and just seeing which species at risk had had status changes here in Newfoundland, and there were a few. How do species end up on the registry and who does this reassessment? That is done by the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, or CASIWIC, as it's called. Um, so CASIWIC was created in 1977 as an independent panel to provide scientifically sound classification of wildlife species at risk of extinction. So essentially, they are an independent panel, and they provide advice to the government. Under SARA, the government of Canada takes CASIWIC's suggestions into consideration, when they establish the official list of wildlife species at risk. Um, so they consider what Kasiwik tells them, but they don't necessarily always follow it. Uh, and the government is responsible for legislating um, protection, not Kasiwik itself. Uh, each year, Kasiwik meets to assign risk categories for all species included in the mandate. So Sarah listed species and new species they're evaluating. A couple of other pieces of legislation I wanted to touch on. Uh, one is the Migratory Bird Convention Act, which was passed in 1917 and then updated in 1994 and 2005, and I believe has just been updated again. Um, 
And so this was a law created to implement the Migratory Birds Convention, which was signed with the US in 1916. Um, this legislation, unlike Sarah, applies on non-federal lands, uh, but it only applies to birds listed under the convention. And presumably you would think that that is all migratory birds, but that is not in fact the case. Um, so weirdly, the Migratory Bird Convention Act uh, does, does include birds that are not migratory, and but does not include all migratory birds. Uh, so fam bird families such as ospreys, kingfishers, our corvids, so our crows and jays, cormorants and owls are not uh, listed under the Migratory Bird Convention Act. And so as it turns out, it wasn't really about whether the birds migrated when they were considered um, uh, and added to the act. It was actually more about whether they were valued or thought to be a pest species. Uh, however, under the Migratory Bird Convention Act, the Canadian federal government can pass and enforce regulations to protect these species of birds that are included in the convention. And then finally, on top of the federal legislation that I've talked about, there is also provincial legislation that is designed to protect species at risk. Uh, and just to add a layer of confusion here, the species that are protected provincially are not always those that are protected federally and vice versa. Uh, although when species are listed under uh, the Endangered Species Act here in Newfoundland and Labrador, um, the government may also take into account what Kasiwik has recommended, uh, as well as our Provincial Species Status Advisory Committee. Uh, so the Endangered Species Act applies to species, subspecies, and populations that are native to the province, uh, doesn't include marine fish, bacteria, viruses, and does not apply to introduced species, uh, for example, such as the moose or some of our, term, um, not ptarmigan species, sorry, some of our, growth, both of our grow species. Okay, so that was a whole lot of legislation that I've just thrown at you, but now we'll get into the meat of this, of today's presentation, and that's going through the species that are listed as, uh, under the Species at Risk Act here in Newfoundland. So the first is the piping plover, and uh, some of you may remember we talked about piping plovers in our shorebirds and game birds presentation. So these guys are small plovers and their range includes the Atlantic coast, the Great Lakes and the Great Plains. So they're actually from Saskatchewan all the way out to here to Newfoundland, but we do have two different subspecies. So one is in the prairies and in Ontario, and then there's one that's in Quebec and Atlantic Canada, the Melodus subspecies. Um, Canada, as it turns out, contains over half the global breeding range for piping plovers. But in 2011, a survey found just over 450 breeding pairs across the country. So we have half the range, but we have only 450 pairs. Um, these guys really like sandy ocean beaches, at least in the eastern part of the range. Uh, in, in Ontario and the Great Plains, they like uh, lake shores, rivers, alkali wetlands. Um, they nest high above the high water line in sandy areas with sparse vegetation. And so our IDs for the piping plover, you've got a light sandy gray back, a dark headband, and then a relatively narrow black band around the breast. Uh, it's often incomplete and orange legs. Um, so uh, something else to note about these guys, that sandy gray back is really excellent camouflage. Uh, so when they crouch down into say a tire track or a footprint in the sand, they can almost disappear. Um, and again, this is a little bit of a repeat from our discussion of shorebirds. Uh, but I just wanted to take a moment to compare the piping plover with the bird that it is most likely to be confused with, and that's the semi-palmated plover. Um, so the big difference that you're looking for here is really the color. Think about wet sand versus dry sand. So with the piping plover, you're looking at a much darker back, a little bit more like wet sand, whereas, or sorry, with the semi-palmated, you've got a darker back like wet sand, whereas with the piping plover, you're looking at a lighter back. Uh, they also have a narrow or incomplete breastband versus a dark complete breastband on the semi-palmated plover. And then the semi-palmated plover looks almost like he's wearing driving goggles. So he has that line between his bill and uh, the bottom of his eye, which the piping plover does not have. Um, so piping plovers in general, again, as many of you may remember from the, um, the shorebirds talk, they, their big problem is that they really, really like beaches but they really, really don't like people. That's pretty much it in a nutshell. Uh, so the Melodus subspecies, the one we have here, was first added to the Species at Risk Registry in 2003, and it is uh, listed as endangered, as is the other subspecies we have here in Canada. 
And the biggest threat to piping plovers is the loss or the degradation of their habitat resulting from our recreational use of beaches. Um, so they like to be on beaches when we show up on beaches with ATVs or with dogs or even just going for a stroll. Um, pipers, uh, piping plovers will often abandon their nests um, and because they really, really don't like disturbance. Uh, also, the garbage that we left that we leave behind often on beaches can attract predators like the red fox, uh, the raccoon, the ring-billed gull, and the crow. Um, so, generally speaking, piping plovers don't do terribly well when people are abundant. Uh, in several Canadian provinces, including New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Ontario, Birds Canada actually has piping plover specific programs to monitor and protect the birds during the nesting season, which generally involves trying to reduce disturbance from people and also protect, protect against predators. Uh, here in Newfoundland, Birds Canada does not manage piping plover populations, but they are monitored by a variety of organizations, including Environment Canada, Intervale, and the Halifu First Nation. Okay, so our next species at risk is the bank swallow. This is our smallest swallow here in Canada. It's also one of the most widely distributed birds in the world. So it's actually found on all continents except Australia and Antarctica. And in the old world, it's known as the sand merton. Um, so these, these guys nest in burrows in banks and sandy cliffs. Uh, they also will take quite happily to gravel and sand piles in construction pits and aggregate pits. Um, and they dig the burrows themselves. So they use their feet, which I assure you he does have, even though you can't actually see it in this amazing picture. Um, they just have very short little legs, but they will use their feet, their wings and their bill to dig out these burrows in gravel and sand piles and sandy cliffs. And they nest in colonies. So sometimes you can get as many as 2000 nests together. Uh, here in North America, bank swallow numbers have declined more than 90% since the 1970s. So they are definitely in trouble. Uh, when you're looking at a bank swallow, he's, he's sort of brown above and pale below uh, with a white throat and then a brown, a brown breast band. Um, and these guys can be a little bit tricky to spot because as you may recall from our other pass run presentation, uh, young tree swallows, young female tree swallows can be a little bit brownish and they are also pale below. So the main ID cues you're focusing on with the bank swallow is that brown breast band uh, and white throat. And then it really it's the size of the swallow. And just to make your life a little bit more complicated, bank swallows also, uh, well, swallows in general, tend to flock in flocks that contain several species. So if you see a big flock of swallows, take your time and look for a slightly smaller brownish swallow and check to see if it has that breast band. So bank swallows are aerial insectivores. And if you remember the uh, state of Canada's birds uh, graph, you'll, you know that aerial insectivores are one of the groups that are in the most trouble. Uh, so these guys eat insects in flight. Um, the reason that aerial insectivores are declining so rapidly, and that's common to virtually all aerial insectivores, we're actually not entirely sure what is going on with aerial insectivores as a group. Uh, for bank swallows, we know that loss of breeding sites can be a threat to the birds, so they're normally pretty tolerant of human disturbance, but a lot of change to the habitat, so that can come from things like erosion control or flood control, uh, or, as, as we have a really good example here lately, um, hurricanes. So Hurricane Fiona has probably made some pretty significant changes to bank swallow habitat. Um, in addition, they're often attracted to construction sites because these construction sites provide appropriate habitat with those gravel, um, gravel piles or sand piles, but then that habitat may get destroyed before the nesting season ends. Uh, another major issue for bank swallows is changes in food availability. Uh, so worldwide, we've seen a general decline in insect populations, perhaps partially due to the use of pesticides. Um, and then on top of that, in addition, in addition to reducing the abundance of aerial insects, pesticides can also accumulate in the bodies of adult birds and affect um, their health and their reproduction. And then finally, climate change is also an issue, perhaps uh, particularly for aerial insectivores, because it may produce what we call a phenological mismatch. Um, so a mismatch in timing. So the peak of nesting may no longer coincide with the peak of insect abundance. Breeding birds generally try and uh, time it so that the when the nestlings need the most food, 
coincides with when we have the most insects around. However, uh, because climate change is changing the timing of both bird breeding and insect reproduction, they may no longer be aligned and that can cause a problem in terms of food availability for young birds. Our next species at risk is another swallow, uh, which like the bank swallow is actually found throughout the world. And in fact, um, barn swallows are the most abundant and widely distributed swallow species in the world. So they breed throughout the Northern hemisphere and they winter throughout much of the Southern hemisphere. Um, these like most swallows are slender, extremely agile birds. Uh, barn swallows often fly relatively low. So they'll skim just inches over the surface of the water or of the land. Barn swallows once nested in caves in North America, but they now build their nests almost exclusively on human-made structures, uh, like barns, hence their name. Uh, they make cup-shaped nests of mud and dried grasses, and these nests are built by both the males and the females and placed under eaves or barn rafters, often under bridges and culverts. Uh, barn swallows are pretty easily recognizable uh, because they are the only North American swallow with a long forked tail. So they do have that beautiful tail, uh, which according to legend, the barn swallow got because it stole fire from the gods to bring to people. And an angry god hurled, hurled a fireball at the bird, singed away the middle tail feathers, and now they have a forked tail. Um, at some times of year, individuals may lack the long tail streamers, which are used as sexual signals in mating. Uh, however, during the summer, you should be able to see them. Uh, they're steely blue above, they have long pointed wings, and then they have those tawny underparts in contrast to our other two swallow species, the tree swallow and the bank swallow, which both have light underparts. So barn swallows should be pretty easily recognizable. Uh, like the bank swallow, the barn swallow is listed as threatened under Sarah. Uh, it was added in 2017. And they are also aerial insectivores. So uh, we know that they're a group that is generally in trouble. Uh, barn swallows declined over 46% between 1966 and 2014. But once again, we're not really sure why that is. Um, they were hunted for the hat trade for a while in the 19th century, but that was quite a while ago. Uh, they may still be hunted for food in parts of their wintering range. Um, and although they originally benefited from the growing human population in North America because they nest on human-made structures, in recent years, this has probably been less to their advantage um, because they like to build their nests on things like bridges and buildings that are often destroyed during routine maintenance, including barns. Um, and nests are actually often destroyed because the droppings accumulating beneath them are considered unsanitary. Uh, loss of food, so changes in food availability are probably also an issue for the barn swallow, like they are for all aerial, aerial insectivores. Um, and the impacts of climate change, and again, that phenological mismatch are also probably an issue for the barn swallow. So we are moving away from our aerial insectivores now into grassland birds, which if you remember back to the graph is also one of the most threatened birds in Canada or groups of birds in Canada. Uh, and here, one of our species at risk, the bobolink is actually found only in a small part of the province. So you're only likely to see bobolinks in the southwestern corner of the province. They are related to blackbirds, um, fairly uncommon here. Uh, their habitat is grasslands, uncut pastures, overgrown fields, and meadows. Uh, so generally, they like agricultural areas, which uh, if you live here in Newfoundland, you know we don't have a huge, huge amount of. Uh, bobolinks are extremely distinct birds, or at least the male uh, is, which you can see on the left there. Uh, they are one of the only bird species that are dark below and light above. Uh, so usually, most birds anyway, want to be dark above so the birds that are looking down on them from above when they're in flight uh, don't see them as well because they blend in with the dark earth and they want to be light underneath so that predators looking up from the ground uh, don't see them as well against the light sky. Bobolinks, on the other hand, um, have been considered as wearing a tuxedo worn backwards. Um, so they are black and white above but black below and then they have this really bright yellow patch on the back of their head. Uh, they have a white rump, white shoulders, and a ragged tail. It looks like his tail is just worn away, but no, it is actually intentionally, or it is naturally ragged. Uh, female bobolinks are obviously a little bit less distinctive, as you can see from the picture on the right there. Uh, they have a dark eye line. They have brown stripes on the crown of their head and a pinkish bill. 
and then an unstreaked nape, but a brown streaked back and they're brown below. So a lot of brown streakiness happening. Um, and I haven't included many sounds tonight, but I did include the sound of the bobolink because I think their song is pretty amazing. To me, it sounds a little bit like R2-D2 from Star Wars having a meltdown. So it's a metallic, bubbly, rambling song, which is a mixture of sharp high notes and buzzy low notes. Uh, and in the spring, males will actually sing their song while giving dis conspicuous display flights low over grasslands. Uh, and when they fly, that white rump that you can see there is particularly visible. So I will see if I can play our bobolink here. So yeah, just, just like a computer having a, a, an R2-D2 having a meltdown, really. Kind of a wonderful song. Uh, so bobolinks are numerous. Well, not here in Newfoundland, but generally throughout their range, they are numerous, but they have undergone a steep decline in the last 50 years. So a total decline of 65% between 1966 and 2015 in the US. Uh, they were added to SARA in 2017 and they are listed as threatened. And here in the province, they're listed as vulnerable. Uh, so the main reason for their decline is really habitat loss. Uh, so loss of native prairies and other grassland habitat which is often due to changes in land use because this is the kind of land that we like to use for agriculture. They do often use things like hay fields for nesting, but that can make them vulnerable to accidental mortality uh, because hay fields are often mowed before the nestlings have fledged. So they are ground nesters and the nestlings are literally sitting ducks when the mower comes through. Uh, pesticide use may also be threatening the species, although this is actually a threat mainly on their wintering grounds in South America. And they've actually been hunted as agricultural press, uh, pests in the southern US and even for food in some places. Um, interestingly, so these guys are currently listed as threatened under, under Sarah. However, they've been recommended by Kasiwik to be downgraded to a species of special concern as of last May, so May 2022. Uh, they are currently being considered for this status change. Okay, and another of our species at risk here, and this is one of our unique Newfoundland subspecies. Uh, so red crossbills are very similar to their cousins, the white-winged crossbill, uh, which I believe Jenna talked about a few weeks ago, uh, but they have no white on their wings. So like white-winged crossbills, they are nomadic rather than migratory. They just wander around in flocks looking for coniferous forest stands with lots of cones, which is what their bills are specialized to eat. Uh, they breed only when there's a cone crop large enough to feed their young, but that means sometimes they breed in winter. So unlike most birds, uh, they don't really have a defined breeding season. So cues for these guys, the biggest cue for crossbill is always going to be that unique bill, which is crossed over at the tip rather than, than having the tips meeting. Uh, the adult males are red overall. Uh, you can't really see on this photo, but males have darker brownish red wings. Some individuals may show wing bars, but not white on their wings. And then the females are yellowish with dark unmarked wings. So uh, you may be surprised to see red crossbills on this list because generally they're considered widespread and numerous. Um, however, as I said, the subspecies that we have here in Newfoundland is unique. So it is larger than mainland subspecies of red crossbills and it sings a unique song. Uh, so it is listed under Sarah as threatened and it was added in 2005. And here in the province, it's listed as endangered. Um, so the main threat for uh, red crossbills is a loss of habitat and a reduction of the cone crops. Um, so that can be due to deforestation, insect infestation and changes in fire regimes. Um, it also is in competition with non-native species, such as the red squirrel, which is an introduced species here in Newfoundland that competes directly with our red crossbills for food. Okay, another big shift in, uh, in species and family generally here, we are moving to ducks now. Uh, so there are three separate populations of Barrow's golden eye here um, that we have here in Newfoundland worldwide. Uh, so in the Eastern North American population, we have approximately 4,500 individuals. Uh, they're most common in Quebec, 
but Newfoundland and Labrador is used by Barrow's golden eye during molting and wintering. They're not known to breed here, but it's thought to be very likely, particularly in the long range mountains. Uh, so uh, under our atlas, we consider them a rare breeder. They breed on shallow freshwater lakes in alpine and uh, subalpine settings, so up to about uh, 6,000 feet. And they really like water in coniferous or aspen woodlands because breeding lakes need to be near treed areas in order for the birds to find nesting sites. Um, so they nest in open, wooded or open country near a lake, uh, usually in a natural cheek cavity. Uh, so an abandoned woodpecker hole, for example, although they will use nest boxes and they'll often go back to the same area to nest. So some of you may remember um, that we have common golden eyes here. So I'll take you through the ID cues for the Barrow's golden eye and then we'll compare them with common golden eyes. Uh, so you see they've got a bright yellow eye, which is where the name comes from, a black head with a white crescent behind the bill, and then they've got kind of a triangular shaped head with a little black bill. Uh, they're black on top, roughly, and white underneath, um, and the wing is black with white spots, but you'll see that they've got a little bit of a spur down the shoulder. Um, so instead of just a, a line between the wing and the, the underparts, you'll see that little spur. Uh, females, of course, female ducks being very, very tricky to distinguish. Females are brown um, and gray, essentially, so relatively not non-colorful. Uh, they have a little yellow bill, a brown head, and a gray body. And so if we compare the common versus Barrow's golden eye, they are very similar in appearance. But for the male, one of the main cues you can use is the shape of that white spot behind the bill. So the Barrow's golden eye has a round white, or sorry, the common golden eye has a round white spot while the Barrow's golden eye has that crescent shaped face patch. Um, the body of the common golden eye is more white. So you see more black on the Barrow's golden eye and you see that black shoulder spur, uh, which you don't see on the Barrow's golden eye. Uh, Females are a little bit more tricky, as they usually are, uh, but there you've got the color of the bill as well. So you've got a yellow versus a darker bill. Um, and you'll see when they're flying, uh, you can see that uh, spur relatively well on, on the Barrow's Golden Eye. So Barrow's Golden Eye, as I said, they like alpine and subalpine habitats. Uh, they tend to breed in remote places, essentially. So it's quite difficult to estimate their population trends. Uh, but the Eastern Canadian population is estimated to be only about 4,000 breeding individuals and is designated as special concern under Sarah. Uh, provincially, they're designated as vulnerable. For these guys, pollution is a major concern uh, because they tend to congregate in a relatively small geographic area, uh, particularly in the winter where they congregate in these rafts. Uh, that tends to be in important shipping corridors, unfortunately. So they are at risk of being limited by oil spills and a bioaccumulation of environmental contaminants. Uh, they're also vulnerable to logging because they nest in treed cavities and some are incidentally killed by hunters each year. Uh, and finally, Climate change is also a major threat to these species because they are alpine and subalpine nesters, and the effects of climate change are particularly pronounced in alpine habitats. Okay, well, I'm not really sure what I was thinking when I put this particular presentation in order because we're moving away from ducks and back to the aerial insectivores again. Uh, and now we're talking about common nighthawks. Uh, so they are another aerial insectivore declining steeply throughout its range which does not include, at, currently include Newfoundland and Labrador. So we have no species, or sorry, Newfoundland specifically. We have no records of the species breeding on the island. Uh, it does breed in Southern Labrador. It's an uncommon visitor here in Newfoundland, but it is considered possible it may breed here. And this is something that we are very interested to discover as part of the Atlas. Um, so if you happen to be interested, Birds Canada also runs uh, night jar surveys in June, which work a lot like the nocturnal owl survey. You go out and survey a route. Um, nighthawk surveys can be really frustrating because mostly you don't pick up nighthawks, uh, but it would be really, really exciting if we did find any record of breeding nighthawks here. So if you're interested, get in touch with me and perhaps we can set you up with a route.
Uh, common nighthawks are most active at dawn and dusk, and they nest on bare ground. So they like things like sand dunes, beaches, forest clearings, burned areas, and sometimes even gravel roofs on buildings that have flat roofs. Uh, they don't make a nest. They basically just lay their eggs on the ground. However, the young are so well camouflaged that they're essentially invisible, uh, and even the adults essentially vanish as soon as they land. So they're really, really masters of camouflage. Uh, so ID cues for a common nighthawk, they're this mottled gray, white, buff, and black, which enables them to hide extremely well. They have a very tiny bill with those exaggerated um, whiskery feathers you can see there. They have a white patch on the lower edge of the wing, which you'll be able to see more when I uh, show a picture of, of the bird flying, and then they have short legs. So when they're flying, they've got these long pointed wings and you can see that white patch much more clearly. Uh, so when they're flying overhead, they're actually pretty easy to identify. Um, they also have a very distinctive call. Uh, they make a buzzy nasal beat call, uh, which actually sounds remarkably similar to another call we've heard uh, during this series. So maybe guesses can go in the chat. If anyone can remember what sounds like this. So can anyone remember what other species makes a pint call? Jenna, you can jump in if anyone has any guesses with that. Uh, male nighthawks also make a dramatic booming display flight. So they fly just above the treetops and then they dive for the ground. And as they pull out of the dive, uh, sometimes, which is just a few meters above the ground, the male flexes his wings downward and the air rushing across the wingtips makes a booming sound. Uh, which sounds a little bit like a race car has just passed by. So that's another distinctive noise. Uh, I see some, some uh, the chat numbers going up. So Jenna, does anyone have a guess what sounds a little bit like common night hawk? Indeed, there are several people who are saying that it is a woodcock. That is correct. Woodcocks are uh, the other species that make a sound an awful lot like this paint. Uh, so well done. I'm super impressed. Um, we would be excited to hear about woodcocks too, but uh, if you happen to hear that peat noise, try and figure out what it is that is making it. Uh, so common nighthawks have been undergoing a steep population decline of 4.2% per year across Canada uh, between 1966 and 2014. So our recent numbers suggest that the species may have declined more than 50% in Canada since the mid 1960s. But it is quite difficult to tell because these guys are masters of camouflage and uh, they're also pretty much nocturnal. So it's difficult to count them in standardized surveys. And that's partly why we're so interested in doing these night jar surveys. Uh, the species has been listed as threatened since 2010, but this is actually one of the species whose um, status has recently changed. So as of February 2023, just two months ago, uh, the status was changed to special concern. Um, and as an aerial insectivore, again, we're not entirely sure what's going on with them as a group, uh, but it's likely it's been affected by the decreased abundance of uh, insects largely due to pesticides. They've also experienced habitat loss, uh, not just of their traditional open habitats, which they like, but also I mentioned they will nest on flat gravel covered rooftops, uh, which they nested on when they uh, adapted to urbanization, but those rooftops are not as common anymore either. Um, they're also really vulnerable to being hit by cars because they forage right over roads and they often roost on them at night. Uh, so road mortality is an issue for these guys. Our next species of concern is the evening grosbeak, really beautiful species, uh, which Jenna talked about in our sparrow webinar. Uh, so this is a pretty chunky bird, a heavy set bird, tends to move in large flocks and it's easily identifiable due to its oversized bill, which it uses to crack seeds. Uh, they place their nests high in trees, which can make them hard to notice. And they really like mature and second growth coniferous forest. Uh, they eat mainly seeds in the winter, but during the summer, they will eat insects, such as the spruce budworm. Uh, so infestation of the forest increases, um, uh, sorry, in infestation of the forest insects on which they feed, uh, which as well as an increase in the use of box elders as ornamental trees, uh, may have allowed evening gross beaks to expand their range eastward during the 1900s. Uh, so they're year-round residents and are found mainly in the southeastern part of the island, 
but not regularly, and they're often only seen in winter. So evening grosbeak males are pretty distinctive. You've got that dark head and then a bright yellow eyebrow and a large pale bill with a bright yellow body, black primaries, so that's the outer wing feathers, um, and then white secondaries, which you can't see on this photo, but essentially that's almost a white wing patch on their backs when the, when the wing is folded. So you can see the, the black primaries there. You can't see the white wing patch on the back of this guy. Females, again, less colorful with a greenish nape and a gray brown body. They do have those white patches on the black wings. So again, they've got the dark outer primaries and then um, white secondaries, and they can have varying amounts of yellow on their body. Uh, so evening grosbeaks are numerous and widespread, although once again, not in here in Newfoundland, uh, but their populations dropped steeply between 1966 and 2015, according to the Breeding Bird Survey, which I've mentioned before. Essentially, it's a root-based survey that's done every year. Uh, here in the east, numbers actually appear to have declined almost by 97%. Uh, and so they were listed under Sarah as special concern in 2019. They are not listed provincially. Um, reductions in numbers of evening grosbeaks may be due partly to logging and development in boreal forests, uh, as well as disease outbreaks like Salmonella and West Nile, and then reduced numbers of insects, including spruce budworm, which we tend to spray for and have been spraying for here uh, in Newfoundland and in the Maritimes, um, and so they're finding it harder to find food. Um, they are also at risk of rain shifts due to climate change. So the range of balsam fir, which they really like, is expected to change. For example, uh, balsam fir is expected to disappear from New England, uh, and it's expected that evening grosbeaks may shift their range to match that. And we're back to the ducks again. Um, so harlequin ducks, another super distinctive bird and absolutely beautiful. They're very small ducks, uh, they're diving ducks. So if you remember, Jenna divided our ducks into two groups, the dabblers and the divers, harlequins are diving ducks. Uh, and they have a really specific requirement for nesting. They like fast moving rocky streams and they feed on things like crustacean, mollusks and insect larvae. Uh, in terms of breeding here in Newfoundland, it's mostly known on the Northern Peninsula, but it may also breed in some rocky bays on the South Coast. And during the winter, they can be found on the south coast of uh, the island, particularly at Cape St. Mary's here on the Avalon. Uh, male harlequin ducks, very, very easy to distinguish. Uh, there's really nothing else that looks like them. Um, they've got that precise white pattern, white and black pattern, really. They're slate blue overall, and then they have a rusty stripe on the head and a rusty red flank. Uh, as is typical of ducks, females are considerably less dramatic. Uh, but they can be distinguished by that round white patch behind the eye, which you can see on those females there. And then between the eye and the bill, their face is pale. Uh, you also, when, as, a, as Jenna said, when you're looking at female ducks, you want to look at sort of the size and the shape to help you narrow it down as well. So harlequin ducks, um, they are another species where we don't have a whole lot of information on population trends uh, because most of the species range is in the northern part of North America, which is remote and frankly, where we don't have that many breeding bird surveys happening. Uh, and that makes it really hard for us to know what's going on with their populations. But wintering populations in Eastern North America are much smaller than historical numbers from the 1800s. So these guys were first added to the Sarah registry in 2003. Uh, and they were reassessed in 2013, but there was no suggestion that their status be changed from that of special concern. And here in the province, they're listed as vulnerable. Uh, we don't really know what the primary cause of declines in harlequin duck populations is. Um, so during breeding, things like timber harvest and hydroelectric development could pose a threat uh, by changing stream flow more than anything and causing an influx of silt which then reduces their invertebrate prey. So because we're changing their habitat, we're decreasing food availability potentially. Um, because during the winter, they tend to congregate on the South Coast here in Newfoundland, they're close to shipping lanes uh, like the Barrows Golden Eye, and they may be susceptible to things like oil spill and runoff. And they can also be caught in fishing nets. Okay, and back we go to the, the aerial insectivores again, uh, the olive-sided flycatcher. 
Uh, so this is a flycatcher associated with open areas in the boreal forest. So they like wetlands, burned, flooded, or partially cut areas. And they perch exactly like this guy is doing at the top of tall, isolated trees and snakes. And then they'll fly out from there to catch insects in midair. They also like to sing from these perches, uh, which means that um, they can actually project uh, their song over quite long distances. So you'll often hear all of sided flycatchers without seeing them. But if you if there is one nearby, you should be able to see it pretty well. So ID cues for all of sided flycatchers. Uh, you've got a dark olive gray vest. So if you look, you look at the bird's underparts there, it looks like he's wearing a little vest. You've got the lighter colored uh, breast and belly and then sort of darker colored shoulder flank area. You've got a white throat and olive gray upper parts. Um, sexes look similar. Uh, and one of the, as you may remember, I talked a lot about how difficult fly catchers were to uh, identify down to species. So one of the best ways to do so is to identify them by song. Uh, so males will sing from the top of the tallest trees and their sound, song sounds a lot like quick three beers. So I'll play that for you now. Quick three beers. Um, so that's a really easy way to tell an olive sided flycatcher and you will very likely hear them before you see them. All right, so oh, there we go, I'm jumping a bit. Uh, because flycatchers are so difficult, I'm just gonna take a minute to go through the four flycatcher species we can expect to find here in Newfoundland, uh, just to refresh your memory. Um, and again, really with flycatchers, sound is probably your most useful way to identify them. Um, we can do it visually here as well though. So we've got our yellow-bellied flycatcher, which as its name suggests, has yellowish wash on the belly. Uh, and it also has yellow wing bars, as you can see on that individual there. Uh, the least and the um, alder flycatchers also both have much more distinct wing bars than the faint gray wing bars you can barely see on our olive-sided flycatcher. Uh, the least is much smaller as well, and uh, you, can, uh, you can see the difference in coloration between the olive-sided and the flycatcher too. Or sorry, olive-sided and alder flycatcher too. But again, sound is your, your go-to with flycatchers. Uh, so all sided flycatchers have declined by 78% between 1968 and 2006, and they were listed on the SARA registry as threatened in 2010. However, the pace of the decline of all sided flycatchers seems to have slowed quite a bit recently. So it was reassessed in 2018 and it was recommended for a status change. So they were recommended to be downgraded from threatened to special concern. And that change happened in February, 2023. So just recently. Here in the province, they're listed as threatened. A uh, major threat to these guys is likely loss of wintering habitat. So not habitat loss here uh, on the breeding grounds, but habitat loss in Northern South America where they spend the winter. Uh, but they may also be affected by changes to habitat on the breeding grounds. Uh, so for example, as I said, they like those cleared areas in the boreal forest, such as burned areas. So altered fire regimes may be affecting the, uh, the quality and amount of habitat avail available to them. And then like all aerial insectivores, there's also this concern with food availability and decreases in availability of insects. Okay, I think we're nearing the end of our list of species here. Uh, so um, our next species is the rusty blackbird. And this bird gets its name from the fact that during fall and winter, the black feathers on the upper parts of the male are edged with rusty brown. Uh, however, the bird doesn't molt entirely new feathers for the breeding season. Rather, the edges of those rusty brown feathers actually wear off to reveal the glossy black breeding pl plumage. Uh, they're opportunistic foragers, but they really like the invertebrates that are found along the edges of the wetland. Uh, so these guys are generally found in wet areas like flooded woods, swamps, marshes, and the edges of ponds. Uh, they are a medium-sized blackbird with a slender, slightly curved bill. So you can see that bill is slightly curved down. Uh, they have a pale yellow eye, and then breeding males are a dark, glossy back, black with a greenish sheen. Um, Non-breeding males are dark brown with rusty edging on the feathers, as I said, and a pale eyebrow. And females are brownish to rusty colored with um, 
with pale, sorry, brownish to rusty colored with pale eyes and a pale eyebrow. Uh, the contrast with the darker feathers around the eye. So you can see the female there. Uh, the song of a rusty blackbird is a jumble of two to three notes followed by a higher rising note. And they sound a lot like the creaking of rusty hinges. Um, so even though rusty blackbirds are actually named after the rusty feathers on the male during the non-breeding season, to me, a really easy, it's, the name is a really easy way to remember the song. Um, so I will play it for you. So yeah, a little bit like a rusty gate opening. Uh, and it's it's quite audible sound. Um, so rusty blackbirds are one of North America's most rapidly declining species. The population has plunged between 85 and 99% over the past 40 years. But, and I, I'm starting to feel a bit like a broken record here, we're not sure why. Um, so a lot of our problems with species at risk is we're not always clear what is driving declines. Uh, approximately 70 to 80 percent of the world's population of rusty blackbirds breeds in Canada, uh, including over 40,000 birds in the Atlantic provinces. So we really do hold perhaps a special responsibility for these guys. Um, as far as we know, the biggest threat to the rusty blackbird is the loss of habitat. So wetlands in particular being lost to development and reservoir creation. And this is particularly an issue on the wintering grounds in the Mississippi Valley. Um, Former hunting of beavers may also have reduced the population by reducing the number of beaver ponds available. Also, for some reason, rusty blackbirds, particularly from northeastern North America, have been recorded with unusually high mercury contamination. Uh, and once again, we're not sure why that is, but it could be contributing to their decline. Uh, so they were added to the Species at Risk Registry in 2009. They're listed as special concern, and provincially, they're listed as vulnerable. Okay, so any of you who were at our owl presentation last week will probably remember the short-eared owl. Uh, it's also called the grass owl, and they are an open habitat specialist. So they like areas like coastal barrens, uh, fields, bog habitats, tundra, and they can hover while hunting. So they forage both by day and night, and they cruise low over open habitats looking for small mammals, and then will hover while they're hunting. Uh, they are ground nesters, and uh, as you may remember, one of the best ways to distinguish the short-eared owl from our other owl species is those black-rimmed yellow eyes. So as Jenna likes to say, they look like they are wearing 90s grunge eye makeup. Uh, they have short ear tufts, but those ear tufts are not always visible. Um, and so that's not the best way to identify them. They are uh, sort of buffy colored with dark streaking. And when they're flying, you can see those dark bars that they have on their long, broad wings. So they have black wingtips, but then they have a couple of dark, almost wrist bars. Um, so short-eared owls really aren't particularly vocal. And given that they are diurnal owls, you are more likely to see them during the day than uh, hear them at night. But they do sing, and their primary song, which is a series of a dozen or more hoots, is given by males during the courtship flight, but also from the ground or from an elevated perch. So I'll play that here. <laughs> and then both males and females can also scream or bark when defending the nest. So short-eared owls, um, again, they're difficult. They are quite difficult to uh, to know exactly what's going on with their population. Uh, but breeding bird survey data suggests that there is a long-term population decline happening across Canada. But the populations may be stable in the Atlantic provinces between 1966 and 2015. Uh, they were placed on the Sarah Registry as special concern in 2012. They were reassessed in 2021, um, and Kasiewicz suggested that they should be uplisted to threatened, uh, but currently that status change hasn't been made, so it's still under consideration. Uh, here in Newfoundland, we're actually considering, so the government does, uh, the provincial government does survey for short-eared owls, and we are considering expanding that program to a volunteer-based program, so stay tuned to hear a little bit more about that. Um, so 
their main issue is increased development and recreational use of these coastal areas that they like, as well as increased agriculture and livestock grazing. So overall, those things uh, result in habitat loss and increased human disturbance in nesting areas. Uh, they really like large uninterrupted tracts of open grassland or barrens. Uh, so they're really sensitive to habitat loss and fragmentation when we break those tracks up into smaller uh, chunks of habitat. Uh, here, they're also likely limited by prey abundance. So things like small mammals, especially like bulls and mice, uh, and they may be um, limited by competition for resources as well as predation of the eggs and juveniles. Okay, peregrine falcons. Um, most of you have probably heard of peregrine falcons because of their sheer speed. Uh, they can reach up to 100 meters per second in a dive and they mainly hunt other birds. So they are formidable hunters. Um, they nest on cliffs. Uh, in this province, they're found mainly in Labrador, although there may be a couple of nests on offshore islands just off the Northern Peninsula. So, ID cues for the peregrine falcon, they've got that bold, dark mustache you can see on their faces, barred underparts, very long pointed wings, and then a slate gray back and wings. Uh, so you'll notice when they're perched, the tip of those long wings actually reaches the tip of the tail. So the subspecies uh, that we have here, it was listed as special concern in 2012. Uh, however, it was reassessed in 2017 and recommended to be downlisted to not being at risk at all. Um, so they the populations declined widely in the 50s to 70s due to the use of DDT, uh, which many of you may be aware uh, resulted in eggshell thinning in many birds of prey and therefore less successful breeding. Uh, however, since DDT was banned in Canada, these, our populations have been rebounding extremely successfully. And I've actually crossed this out because probably the peregrine falcon should no longer be in our presentation because it has in fact been declared not at risk now. So it's been removed from the species at risk registry. Uh, that being said, pesticides on their wintering grounds, so South and Central America do continue to be a problem as, as does human disturbance of nests, uh, illegal harvest for falconry, and in some cases, a lack of suitable nest sites or a lack of prey. All right, and I think that brings us to our last two species, uh, which I left to last because they're not actually on the Sarah registry right now. Um, so the gray cheek thrush, there are two subspecies of gray cheek thrush uh, in Canada. Um, so they nest, gray cheek thrush nests from easternmost Russia across Alaska throughout Northern Canada, and they're mainly found in habitats where the boreal forest meets the tundra. So one subspecies, Elysiae, stretches across most of the continent, but here in Newfoundland, we do have a unique subspecies, uh, the Minimus subspecies, which is found only here. Uh, and here we find them in habitats associated with the southern boreal forests. So mature spruce forests with heavy, tall shrub cover, uh, conifer thickets, old growth balsam fir forests. So gray cheek thrush, uh, are kind of a plain little thrush. Uh, they're medium size, they have this grayish face, but they do not have a prominent eye ring and they don't have any hint of buffy color on the gray face. So when distinguishing from other thrush species, which I'll get to in a minute, really what you're looking for is the lack of anything on the face of the, the gray shaped thrush. Um, they are whitish, they have whitish underparts with grayer flanks. And then they have uh, those spots on the breast, which are common in thrushes, but the intensity of the spotting varies among individuals. The song of the gray cheek thrush is a burry but ethereal sounding uh, flute like series of flute like notes with the middle phrase high pitched and rising, and the last phrase lower and descending in pitch. So I'll play that for you. So it's distinctly thrush like. Oops. I guess there's more of it there. Hang on, I'll keep, let it keep going. So you can hear that high pitched rising middle phrase and then the lower and descending last phrase. And the ending is usually consistent, but the first part of the song can vary a great deal among individuals. Um, and so again, I realize we're going a little over time here. So of course, leave when you need to, but we're almost done with our species at risk. Um, so 
I wanted to take a moment to talk about the difference, the way you can distinguish between the thrushes that we have here in Newfoundland. Uh, all, all the other three species were covered in our other passerines webinar. Uh, so for the hermit thrush, the main ID cue that you're looking for is that difference in coloration between the tail and the back. So they have that rusty reddish tail, but a brownish back. Uh, for the viri, the main difference is that the back is also that dark red brown. So you've got a darker back than other thrushes, but no contrast between the back and tail and a very plain face. Um, keep in mind that viri really aren't that common here in Newfoundland, uh, so they're really only found in the southwest corner of the island. You're unlikely to see them elsewhere. Um, the Swainson's thrush, unlike the gray cheek thrush, has that buffy eye ring and the buffy, it almost looks like they're wearing buffy spectacles, um, whereas the gray cheek thrush has a very plain face. Uh, I should mention here that American robins are also a thrush of Newfoundland, but I have not included them in this picture because everybody does recognize them. Uh, so great cheek thrush have kind of an interesting story here. They were formerly common on the northern peninsula and the northeast coast and on the Avalon, uh, although they were less common on the west coast and in the interior. But data from the breeding bird survey suggests a pretty dramatic decline in population, up to 95% in coastal parts of Newfoundland over a 40 year span. So they went from being pretty common on breeding bird survey routes to extremely uncommon. They are currently listed as threatened under the Provincial Endangered Species Act. They don't have a status under SARA yet. However, uh, an assessment report is currently being prepared by, uh, for Kasiwik by none other than Jenna McDermott. Uh, so I'm sure she'd be happy to answer some of your questions about the gray cheek thrush. Uh, we're not entirely sure, again, why the Newfoundland subspecies of gray cheek thrush has declined so dramatically, but one potential reason is the introduction of red squirrels here on the island of Newfoundland. Uh, they're not native here, and they are predators that will uh, prey on eggs and nestlings. Um, we may also be looking at issues of habitat loss and also collisions during migration with uh, human-made structures. And our final species here today is the leech's storm petrel. Uh, and here I really feel like we're circling back to the beginning of this series because our first webinar was about seabirds. We're coming back to seabirds. Um, so leeches storm petrels are very small seabirds. They're about the size of a robin, and they're the only storm petrel that breeds here in Newfoundland. Uh, they're a member of the Procellariform family, which you may remember means tube noses. Uh, and so they share traits with birds like albatrosses and fulmar, which includes using their sense of smell to guide navigation. Um, they have an extremely long lifespan, so up to 40 years, which is pretty impressive for a bird as small as the storm petrel and delayed breeding. Uh, Leech storm petrels weigh about 50 grams, but they can range up to 1,200 kilometers offshore to find food during the breeding season. So ID cues for Leech storm petrel. Uh, you've got a long tail with a deep notch, short legs. You've got that tube nose, which you can barely see on the picture there. And then a pale carpal bar, so that white bar on the wings, which reaches all the way to the leading edge of the wings and they have long angled arch wings. Uh, and again, just a little refresher, the only other species of storm petrel you're likely to see here in Newfoundland is the Wilson storm petrel. Uh, and the main ID cues to di di distinguish between the two of them is that the carpal bar does not go all the way to the leading edge of the wing on the Wilson storm petrel. The Wilson storm petrel does not have a forked tail and the Wilson storm petrel has longer legs. So you can actually see the legs stretching out beyond the end of the tail. Um, it's also probably not an issue you're going to have because Wilson storm petrels breed all the way down in Antarctica and they're rarely seen on land once they travel away from their breeding grounds. So any storm petrel seen on land here in Newfoundland is probably a leeches. Um, leeches storm petrels are also not yet listed under SARA, but they are under consideration for listing. Uh, so it's been recommended that they, they be listed as threatened uh, the decision there is pending. And some of you may remember from our uh, first talk about seabirds that we're seeing a pretty dramatic decline. Um, so uh, in, the in the colonies here around Newfoundland, we're talking about uh, a decline of 50%, um, which equates to a loss of 3.3 million storm petrels over the last 20 to 30 years. Uh, and some of the threats, again, we're not entirely sure what's going on with them, but uh, light pollution is a contender, so they can be attracted to light 
um, for example, at offshore oil rigs, uh, and that may lead them into danger. Uh, there could be shifts in the availability of their food, so the availability of their prey species. Uh, pollution may also be an issue for these guys. We seem to be seeing high mercury concentrations in leeches storm petrels here as well, and predation could also be an issue. All right, well, I've already gone six minutes over, and I apologize for that. So much to say about species at risk, uh, but we are going to end with a quiz. So I have eight questions here today. Some of them are a little bit different than usual. Lots of them are species ID questions, but some of them are perhaps a little bit, a uh, little bit, little bit of a change. Uh, so we will start with this question. What? Oops. There we go. I guess I'm going to give you the answer to that question. So, which of the following species would call a place like this home? Uh, so, if anybody didn't catch the, the me flashing the answer there, go ahead and make your guesses. But people seem pretty, uh, pretty sure of this one. All right, put your final guesses in. Got 73% participation. A few more people need to guess to, ha to hit 80%. Any more guesses? All right, looks like we're ending there. Uh, so the overwhelming majority of you said that it was a bank swallow colony and that's exactly what it is. So bank swallows like to dig their burrows in sandy banks, just like that. Um, leeches storm petrel is also a good guess because leeches storm petrels do dig burrows. They actually tend to be found more in Tuckamore though, as opposed to in these sandy banks like this, but they are also a colony nester that nests in banks. Uh, all of sided flycatchers build open cup nests in trees and barn swallows nest in human structures like barns and uh, bridges and culverts, that kind of thing. And they also build open cup nests. Uh, okay, so next question. What species is this? Who do we have here? Okay, still more guesses coming in. All right, I'm going to stop the poll, get in your last guesses. Okay, so the majority of you, once again, got it right. This is an olive-sided flycatcher. Uh, he's doing exactly what we said olive-sided flycatchers like to do. They like to sit on uh, lone, sort of exposed trees, and uh, they like to sing up there. Um, the big cue for saying it's an olive-sided flycatcher is that little vest that he's wearing. So you can see the, uh, the distinctive vest. This guy's a little bit tricky though, because it does look like he's got a yellow wash on his belly. Um, so I can see where you got yellow-bellied flycatcher. And uh, the main cue that I told you to distinguish between alder and least versus olive-sided is the wing bars. And to be fair, you cannot see the wing bars on this guy. So it was a tricky question. All right, so now we have a sound question. Uh, so I will play the sound and then I will, uh, at least I'll try and play the sound. Then I will put the poll up. So I'll play that once more. Okay, and see if you know, who that sound belongs to. All right, any final guesses? Oh, we've hit 80% participation. We're doing well. All right, I'm going to end the poll, get your final guesses in. Okay, so 80% of you said bobolink, 
And that is, in fact, the right answer. Thank you, Bobbly. Uh, so, song like R2-D2 having a meltdown. Um, I can see both where you got Rusty Blackbird and Great Cheek Thrush, though. Uh, Rusty Blackbird, you'd hear a shorter song, but also more of a, a grating rusty noise, like rusty hinges or a rusty gate. And Great Cheek Thrush would be more melodic. So thrushes in general have a very ethereal sound to them. They don't sound quite as metallic as the bobolink. All right, next question. Okay, this is another identify the species question. So what species do we have here? All right, get your final guesses in. We've hit 80% again, which is exciting. Remember, there's no penalty for getting it wrong. All right, I'm going to end the poll there and share the results. So this one was a little bit tricky. Um, almost 60% of you said a killdeer, and that is, in fact, the correct answer. Uh, so we do have killdeer here on Newfoundland. Uh, they're perhaps not as common as they are in some other places, but a really important identifying cue for killdeer is that double breast band, which is unique. Um, it was a little bit of a trick question because killdeer we didn't cover today. We talked about piping plovers and semi palmated plovers. Uh, both of them would have a single breast band rather than two. Um, and then the piping plover would have what looks like driving goggles, which you can almost see on the killdeer. Uh, and the semi-palmated plover would not, uh, has only the, the headband across the front. Um, least sandpipers would be kind of a different shape. Uh, so among other things, they would have a longer bill. Sandpipers tend to have very long bills, whereas plovers, uh, which forage visually instead of by touch with the end of the bill, have shorter bills. Okay, so another species ID question. We're more than halfway now. So who is this? Well, people are very sure of this one. Okay, just a few more guesses. At 80% anymore. Okay, 84%. We'll call it there. All right, so most of you are very sure on this. This is indeed an evening gross beak. So this is a female evening gross beak uh, with sort of that greenish yellowish wash and then the black and white wings. Um, both the white wing crossbill and the pine gross beak. I, they're reasonable guesses because the females are very colorful like that. Um, female pine gross beaks, you would expect yellow on the head and then almost a reversal of this pattern. So yellow on the head and gray on the body and a dark beak. And th those black and white wings would be missing on both of the other species. Okay. Oh, well, apparently I'm just going to tell you the answer to this one. Oh, no, I'm not. Nope. Sorry. Never mind. Uh, I forgot this is a this is a slightly different question. So I'm going to play you the sound of the common nighthawk. Okay, so this question, I just played you the common nighthawk call. So what other species covered during this bird ID series makes a very similar sounding call? And I know that most of you know this because we already discussed it in this presentation. Okay, get your guesses in.
right, seventy five percent participation. Anybody have some guesses they want to add? Okay, so I'm going to end the poll here. Excellent. Okay, so the majority of you did answer the American woodcock, which we already talked about uh, in this presentation. So you are correct. American woodcocks, we've got a recording of them here, make a very similar sound to a common nighthawk. Uh, so it was a tricky question. Uh, bitterns are also difficult to see and easy to distinguish by their noise, but they make almost a gulping noise, a little bit like water, like a boom kind of noise. Uh, and Wilson Snipe and Boreal Owl were also a little bit of a trick question because they kind of, they're, they're the sounds that are easy to confuse with each other. Uh, so both of them make almost a fluttery noise. Uh, which in the boreal owl is the song, and in the Wilson snipe is the sound of wind passing over their outer tail feathers during display dives. All right, so there are just two more questions here. Uh, thank you, Mr. Woodcock. All right, so who do we have here? Uh, I don't know why it's not letting me launch the poll. Okay. Well, for some reason, it's decided that we are not going to do our last couple questions. Not entirely sure why. Well, Catherine, did this. you stop sharing the old one uh, before trying to launch the new one? I think so, yeah, but it seems to have disappeared. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um, do you see the the other one, Jenna? Do you see the the poll, the the one that I was oh, sharing here. before? Yeah, I'll open it. Ah, there we go. Okay, all right. Thank you. Technological difficulties always fun. Uh, so, who do we have here? All right, get your last guesses in. Okay. All right, so this is the ever tricky thrush question. We had people guessing every species of thrush, although the majority of people did guess um, the great cheek thrush, which is our species at risk. This is not a great cheek thrush. This is a Swainson's thrush. So thrushes are hard, take home message. It's not a hermit thrush, uh, although it's a little bit difficult to tell, but the main thing is that um, gray back and then reddish tail. It's not a viri because it does have facial markings and the whole back isn't that reddish color. It's a Swainson's thrush because it has those buffy glasses on essentially, whereas a gray cheek thrush would have a much plainer face. But again, this was a tricky one because I realized that it is the gray cheek thrush that we were focusing on tonight. All right, and we have one last poll and let's see if it will let me do it. Okay. Oh, seems to be happy to let me do it again. So who do we have here? got two competing species happening. Okay, get your final guesses in. Okay. Well, great job, everyone. I was all about the trickery tonight. Uh, so it's not a red-winged blackbird because we don't see the red wings. And if it were a female, it would be brownish, not black. All of you knew that it wasn't a bobolink, which is awesome because as remember, as I said, the bobolink is actually light on the back and dark underneath. Um, we've got almost an even split between a grackle and a rusty blackbird. 
This is, in fact, a common grackle. Um, that iridescent color is really, it's, it's more of a grackle thing, particularly that, that sort of bluish coloration. And if you look at the tail in this photo, you can see that it is quite long. So grackles are like a blackbird that's really been sort of stretched out. They've also got a pretty substantial bill on them. Okay, so that is it for tonight. Um, I will say thank you to all of you for attending and for putting up with me going over again. Um, and I hope that we will see you out in a couple of weeks. So we have no webinar next week uh, because it is Easter Monday, but we will have another webinar on the 17th of April where I will be talking about the Breeding Bird Atlas. And I hope that you join us for that because uh, we would really love to see you put your new skills to use for the Atlas to help us with this big citizen science project. Uh, and then our last webinar will be on the 24th of April and Jenna will be sharing her really excellent knowledge about learning to bird by ear, which is a really fun challenge. Thanks, okay. Catherine. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> We're getting, you're getting a lot of thank yous and great presentation, tough quiz uh, in the chat. It was a tough quiz. I'm sorry. I, I was probably a little over ambitious today with the quiz. <laughs> um, and there was just one question from back at the beginning when you were talking about the Migratory Bird Convention Act. And um, someone was wondering how Canadian laws and US laws interact for that and if the same species are on both. Um, and I hoped you had an answer since I so that's a really good question. was not sure. I don't think laws necessarily really interact because Canadian laws apply in Canada and American laws apply in the States, uh, but the same groups of birds are listed under uh, the Migratory Bird Convention um, Treaty. So yes, it is the same families of birds. Uh, some of those may only occur in the States, some individual species may only occur in the States, and some may only occur in Canada. But generally speaking, we have agreed on the families of birds that we will list under this act. Uh, and those are shared by the US and Canada. Perfect. And that was the only main question in the chat. We've just been chatting in there mostly today. <laughs> Excellent, glad to hear it. All right, well, if there are no more questions, I assume you're watching the chat, Jenna, because I can't read through 70 messages all at once. Um, but yeah, if there are no more questions, I'll just say thank you again for coming out tonight. And I hope we see you in a couple of weeks. Perfect. Thanks, Catherine. Have a good night, all. Have a good night.